Uh, yeah. So yeah. So welcome to everybody and uh, to the second talk in the gauge gravity uh, seminar series. So this is a seminar series that we started recently, and it will focus broadly on uh, diverse topics of uh, gauge and gravity theories. And these seminars, they uh, we are planning to held roughly like twice a month on Wednesday afternoons. And we will record them and upload them in the CHEP YouTube channel. And we hope these seminars will bring the experts in this area and uh, will become a platform for idea exchange and uh, academic activities. So a couple of remarks for the talk. Uh, during the talk, the audience is uh, requested to be, uh, please be muted. And uh, the members can ask the questions while uh, either in the end of the talk by raising the hand, or if it is an urgent question, then maybe they can write it in the chat box and we will read it. And, um, or if there are small breaks, like if the speaker has uh, asking something in the middle, then maybe we can ask still the questions. And uh, today the speaker is Jean-Luc uh, Lenners. So he will tell us about a small universe. And currently he is a, a ERC research group leader in theoretical cosmology. In the past, he has held position in Perimeter, Princeton, and Cambridge. So let's uh, join uh, to welcome the speaker, Jean-Luc Lenners, and let's hear from him. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Gaurav, and, and thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to give this talk. Um, Unfortunately, I can't be there in person. That would be that would be very nice, but um, maybe some other time. Yes, yes, you are welcome in the future. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, what I would like to talk about is um, essentially some possible consequences of the no boundary proposal that uh, I've recently been been working on. And this is work um, that was done. Um, Oh, now it works. Uh, that's work that was done together with Jérôme Quintin, uh, who is at the University of Waterloo. And uh, it's based on many earlier works that I, I did with uh, Ali Ceditucci, Job Fellbrugge, Caroline Jonas, uh, Laura Sperner, Neil Turok, uh, and other people. Um, so I won't cite them every time, but all of this is based on this joint work. Now, if we describe the universe, we use the Friedman equation, which is written out here as a sum of energy contributions, which sum up to one. And so we have contributions due to ordinary matter, uh, due to radiation, due to potential scalar field, uh, and also due to curvature. So there's a term here, which is just describing the uh, homogeneous curvature of the universe. Now, this term is often not talked about very much, but actually this term by itself already gives us kind of an idea of how big the universe is. Um, that's because in if one assumes a simple topology, and if the universe is uh, either um, open, so hyperboloid, or closed, like a sphere, uh, then actually the curvature term immediately gives us an idea of the size of the universe as given on the by the formula on the bottom right. Now, observationally, we know that the curvature term is very small. Uh, in fact, it's consistent with being zero, uh, with the universe just being exactly spatially flat. Uh, but, uh, at the, but we don't know that for sure. Right? Really, what we can say is that the curvature term is very small on the order of 1%. And um, that's the bound that the Planck satellite gives, for instance. Now, if we use this formula at the bottom, we can translate this immediately into a lower size of the universe, which then comes out as on the order of a few times the current Hubble scale. Okay, so we know that the universe must be at least a few times the current Hubble scale in size. Uh, that's if we assume a simple topology. Now, people have looked at more complicated topologies. So basically, if the universe, for instance, was a, a torus, here's an example given in, in two dimensions on the upper left, one can represent the torus by, you know, by a tiling of the plane, um, a simple tiling in, in terms of rectangles. Now you see if there is, and then each each of these rectangles would be identified. Now, um, if there's a source of light S um, coming towards the observer O, 
uh, then you know there will be other source well from the same source there will be other paths around the torus geometry of the universe that can reach us too now light will have to leave earlier and come from a different direction to reach us at the current time nevertheless one source translates into an infinity of of um of signals of that become less and less luminous uh, on the right here is a more complicated example given by a dodecahedral shape uh, of the universe. Um, now, that means that if the universe has a non-trivial topology, we should see these kind of repeating patterns in the universe. And people have searched for this in the CMB and have not found any evidence of such patterns. Um, and again, the fact that there is no evidence for non-trivial topology means that um, that there is a sort of a lower limit on the size of the universe, and that lower limit comes out comes about to something like six uh, current six Hubble radii. So this is in complete agreement with this um, bound on the on the curvature of the universe. And so in that sense, um, we are justified uh, to to assume that the universe has a, has a simple topology. And that's what I'm going to assume for the next for the rest of the talk. Now, the question still remains, how big do we actually think that the universe should be? I mean, how, how big do we expect the universe to be? And this depends on, on its entire history. So there was a, an expansion now during the matter area, uh, sorry, matter era. Going back in time, there was the expansion during the radiation era, which, um, is given by this ratio of the reheating temperature divided by the temperature at matter radiation equality. If there was a period of inflation, then there is an um, expansion during inflation. And moreover, the current size of the universe, of course, depends on, on what the size was before inflation started, or whatever it was that that made the that that happened during the early universe. Now, so clearly. The current size of the universe depends quite strongly on how long this inflationary period lasted and how large the primordial size was already. So that means that the current size depends on what kind of model you have, on what kind of model you have for, for the um, history of the universe, but also for the origin of the universe. Now, I should say that I will formulate this talk in the language of path integral quantization of gravity. Uh, that means that that's a simple semi-classical approach to quantizing gravity, and um, which is done in complete analogy with Feynman's approach to, to um, just to uh, quantum field theory. Now, or even quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanics, what you do is you sum over, if you want to calculate an amplitude for a particle to go from A to B, you sum over all possible paths that link A to B, and each path gets weighted by a phase which is given by the action divided by H bar. Uh, and you sum over all these paths, and that will give you the amplitude. Now, if we do this with gravity, uh, the analogous thing of the path is actually a whole four-dimensional geometry with matter on it. So really what we are summing over is um, an entire set of, of possible four-dimensional geometries for the universe. Or put differently, the analogy with going from point A to, uh, to point B is basically to link one spatial section of the universe with a second spatial section of the universe. And we sum over all possible geometries that interpolate between these two spatial configurations. And then the probability for such a transition amplitude will be proportional to mod psi squared, at least approximately. With gravity, this is not fully settled, whether this is what the correct uh, formula is. But in situations where the geometry of the universe is um, approximately classical, one can show that mod psi squared is a good approximation. Now. Let's go back to the question from before. What, how do we, you know, how large do we expect the universe to be? 
Now, for this, we have to consider complete cosmological models, because if we don't have a complete model, we, we lack uh, one of the ingredients in determining the size. So, for instance, inflation by itself is not really a complete model. At least non-eternal inflation isn't, because it requires initial conditions. So there is some initial spatial section here in green, which will expand during inflation. And then inflation comes to an end here on this orange um, slice. However, one has to specify what the conditions are on this green slice in order for inflation to start. And also one has to specify how large this region is. So simply a simple model of inflation by itself does not tell us anything about the current size of the universe. Eternal inflation is somewhat potentially somewhat better in that respect because it, um, it is potentially a complete model. I'm saying potentially because it is plagued by all sorts of, of uh, infinities once you start calculating physical quantities. Now, for with eternal inflation, the idea is that some regions will inflate and inflation will come to an end in these orange regions, but there remain some small regions in green here which keep inflating and will produce new large regions of the universe um, and so on. And this process never stops. Now, the trouble with this is that if you calculate simple quantities like the action of reaching our current field values, so let's say we are here in this dotted circle or ellip dotted ellipse here, um, then if you just calculate the action of going from an earlier time to that present field configuration, um, in fact, it diverges. And this is one of many indications that um, eternal inflation is not really physically sensible. Um, so I will, I will not discuss it further now here. Now, a completely alternative kind of model is the cyclic universe model. Um, and in this kind of, of model, the universe expands and contracts again, and then expands again and contracts again. And it's the reversal from contraction to expansion, which we perceive to be the Big Bang. Um, now, the trouble with such a model is, is in a sense quite similar to eternal inflation. If you again calculate the action at a certain current slice, let's say here where you see some galaxies here, um, well, it just by, becomes infinite because of this infinite number of cycles. If you assume that the cyclic model is not really fully cyclic, but only has a, a finite number or perhaps even just one bounce before the current expanding phase, then again, then it's also difficult to make this, this uh, model complete. Well, because you, you sort of run into the same issue that we had with the non-eternal non inflation. You have to explain how the space-time arose and how the conditions for a contracting phase you know came to be and um, so unless there is such a model which includes this we cannot uh, make a prediction for the current size of the universe now one framework which actually does provide a potentially complete model is the no boundary proposal and so let me let me review let me or at least show one way of, of motivating it so now let's here in this cartoon, the universe is meant, to, the spatial section of the universe is meant to be a circle. Uh, so let, in, in the no boundary proposal um, requires a closed section of the universe. So that the simplest case is just a three dimensional sphere. And um, here, so here, this is drawn simply by dropping two dimensions and then uh, we're left with a circle. As we go, Back in time, the universe was smaller, so this circle was smaller. And you, you know, at every um, every prior epoch, you can ask, so what came before? You would have to specify initial conditions on this on a particular boundary. So you can do this at say the transition between matter and radiation equality, or at the transition between radiation equality, between radiation phase and an inflationary phase, and so on. But in principle, this could sort of never end. And um, the idea of Hartland Hawking was to say, well, if the if you round off the geometry so that there is no boundary anymore, um, then you don't have to specify further conditions. And then this might explain simply the 
creation or just the existence of the universe. Right. So there would be no further. Their idea was there would be no further requirement for any any conditions to be specified. Now, in a Lorentzian geometry, this is simply impossible because of the singularity theorems that Penrose and Hawking proved. If you have a, um, a Lorentzian universe and you go back in time and it gets smaller and smaller, um, it tends to have a trapped surface. And in fact, this will automatically lead to a singularity in the past. But if there's a singularity in the past, it means there's a point where we don't know what happens, where one would have to put boundary conditions. And so then again, that would not be a complete model. Whereas if one does round off the universe, it stands a chance of being complete. Um, however, this then, from the argument just given, requires going beyond Lorentzian geometry. And in fact, the geometry near this bottom part needs to be Euclidean, just like the surface of a ball. Um, and uh, in that case, uh, one can have a, a closed and regular geometry. So the idea that Hartle and Hawking then had was that in this, this path integral, we would sum over all configurations of geometries and meta configurations, which are rounded off in the past. So which don't have a boundary to the past. There would just be the final boundary, which you can think of as being today and uh, with the current field values. So the wave function would be a function of these final field values. Um, but And in the path integral, one would sum over all geometries and meta configurations which lead to these final field values, but are um, where the geometry is rounded off in the past. So does it mean so, that uh, when you start from Euclidean and it uh, so it eventually has to be Lorentzian, right? Yeah. So in fact, the um, um, yes, I'm coming to that in in a minute. In fact, uh, so just give me one minute. I will I will address precisely okay. this issue. Um, actually, let me say it straight away since you're asking. So the idea is that really. You see, there's a final field configuration up here on this final um, spatial slice of the universe. And, and then one sums over geometries which are rounded off in the past. But you see, these geometries which you're summing over are not the physical space-time. Really, what one does is one looks at a series of such final configurations, which with a history of possible field values. And if the probability is high for such a, such a history, then one would say that, you know, that sequence of final configurations is the physical space-time. And that will be a Lorentzian space-time. And the reason why this is a Lorentzian space-time is that the probability tends to be high when the wave function um, is of WKB form, and when it's of WKB form, in fact, that means that um, these these final configurations are solving the Einstein equations, the Lorentzian Einstein equations. So these things are linked. So the 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 WKB form reduces to the in a sense to the Friedman equation, or let me say I'll say it differently, it, the same condition which gives you the WKB form for the wave function gives you the Friedman equation for these final configurations. And so if the wave function is of WKB form, one predicts a classical Lorentzian space-time to emerge. That's also another way of saying it. On the other hand, if the wave function is not of WKB form, we cannot really describe the resulting space-time classically. So this would be a situation um, that would happen at early times in the no boundary proposal when the universe comes into existence in a sense right at very early times you cannot give it a classical description so um, am i correct in understanding this uh, top curve that you have in this picture as some kind of uh, time that becomes lorentzian at late times yeah this would be the infer the curve is meant to represent the inferred classical history at late times yeah. 
Yeah. At late times, right. but early times it would not have like a classical description. That's what you're as you if you go back too far, there would be no such classical. Yes, exactly. Okay. There would Thank be you. no such classical description that would be possible. Um, so, and the idea would be to to have this sum over these these geometries, but then one can approximate this uh, integral simply by a saddle point. Um, in in the sort of semi-classical approximation when when h bar or sorry or more precisely when the action divided by h bar is very large um so you see the the advantage compared to what i was saying earlier about the action blowing up is that this is constructed such that the if you calculate the action you know this is finite this geometry is finite and regular so the action will automatically be a finite number and so um, it would, by construction, in a sense, that is try. You know, this should be semi-classically well defined. Now, when the action is very large compared to h bar, then the um, then just as in in ordinary quantum mechanics, the transition amplitude or the wave function is um, approximated by a saddle point. And the saddle point is a point where the action is stationary, so where the classical equations of motion are satisfied. However, the fact that we want these geometries to be rounded off means that we will need a solution of the classical equations of motion, which is not a Lorentzian solution, because the Lorentzian solution will not give this rounding off. It needs to be a complex solution in general of the equations of motion. So the saddle points are solutions of the Einstein equations, but they are complex solutions of the real Einstein equations. Now, another point, which actually I won't discuss today, but I think it would be good to mention it, is that the general prescription for how this integral is done in detail does not is not known. Um, one can study certain simple examples um, where one restricts the number of fields. This is called mini superspace, for instance, where you just consider the scale factor of the universe and maybe an anisotropy function, but you don't consider the full, a full general metric. And in these mini superspace examples, it is when you study them, you notice that, in fact, one cannot define the integral as summing over, over purely Euclidean metrics. Um, this simply doesn't work because these, this integral is divergent. That was the original idea of Hartland Hawking, but unfortunately it doesn't work. Um, one also cannot uh, sum over Lorentzian space times uh, because it turns out that this gives the wrong saddle point. I will briefly come back to that later. But in fact, one has to sum over um, complex or classes of complex metrics. And also one needs to impose the appropriate mathematical boundary conditions at the initial hype uh, at sort of at this rounding off point so the point the, the idea is that there should be no boundary but even having no boundary you know the integral still requires boundary conditions and so finding the correct ones is is um is non trivial um now this this has been studied by many people and i should of course also mention that your group um, is is also working on on trying to make uh, to study precisely these these issues um, and which which are very non-trivial and it would be nice if eventually one would find a general prescription for what what can work. Uh, now, I, in this talk, for the purpose of this talk, I will simply assume that the integral exists and that it can be approximated by the appropriate saddle points, and then. Rather, I want to look at what could be the, the physical consequences. Uh, Jinluk, I have a question. Yes. Uh, sure. So in, the, uh, in this slide, the previous slide, so you mentioned yes. that Euclidean, uh, the integral over Euclidean metric does not convert. So are you referring to this conformal factor problem in this one? I think that's one that's one reason for it, yes. Okay. Uh, I... But base, it's very simple in the sense that you just see that if you sum over Euclidean metrics, there is always one asymptotic region for which the the um, the action diverges. And I mean, yes, the, in a sense, the origin of this is really the, the conformal mode problem, because 
that implies that the action is unbounded from below and it's also unbounded from above. So also there's no way you can change the, somehow do a different Vick rotation and change the the, the previous, uh, sorry, the prefactor, um, the sign in front of it. So really there will always be some region of, of field space of Euclidean uh, in the field space of Euclidean metrics in which the the integral diverges. And that okay. means that it's simply mathematically not defined. Okay, okay, I see, yeah. Now, okay, let me give you a couple of examples of such no boundary geometries. The simplest case is essentially an um, a gluing of the sitter space with Euclidean, the sitter space. Now, the sitter space can be Lorentzian, the sitter space can be represented um, if you take the, sorry, let me start again. If you look at the sitter space in the closed slicing, so where the spatial sections are three-dimensional spheres, then it can be represented as a hyperboloid uh, where these three-dimensional spheres expand, but in fact, uh, they, they come to a minimum size and if you one were to continue this uh, geometry, it would expand again. So really, this is a, a classical bounds space-time. But here, we would cut off the, that Lorentzian space-time at the waist, so at the minimum radius, and glue onto it a section of Euclidean, the Sitta space, which is just a four-dimensional sphere. So if you take half of a four-dimensional sphere in purple here, you can glue it on to this um, Lorentz in the sitter geometry. One can describe this by going to a, a complex time coordinate. Um, so here tau would be, if tau is real, it's Euclidean time. time. If tau is imaginary, it would be Lorentzian time. Then one could represent this geometry uh, where the solution of the equations of motion is simply sine of tau. So one could represent this solution by going from zero to pi over two, which is the, the maximum the equator of the sphere, then doing uh, a Vick rotation into Lorentzian time, and then um, continuing along the Lorentzian time, where this function then analytically continues to cosh of Lorentzian time t. Okay, so that's the simplest example of a no-boundary geometry. Now, one can also add a scalar field, and then things get more complicated. Um, let me go back to this and say something else. So along this path here, which is first in purple, then in green, you see the, the field, the scale factor A, uh, takes real values. But everywhere else, this these values would be complex. So it's only along this line here um, that, that A takes real values. If one adds a scalar field and plots where that scalar field takes real values, then one gets uh, a kind of a line like the one here on the right graph for a general scale, scalar field value at the bottom of the geometry. And one can do the same for the scale factor of the universe. And you see then also it becomes real along this black line, but it's not the same as this line that I had before. And moreover, for a generic scalar field value, you see at late times, as we go up in this graph, if one would put these two graphs on top of each other, these lines would not overlap. That means that you could either have the scalar field being real at late times, or you could have the scale factor real at late times, but not both. So you, you wouldn't get a classical universe, basically. What you have to do is you have to tune the imaginary part of the scalar field for instance, you have to tune it right at the at zero, at the bottom of the geometry. And if you do that, you can tune it such that these two lines will overlap at late times. That means that Sorry, can you can tune it what... such that at late times, the um, geometry become that the, both the scale factor and the scalar field take real values. Yes. So uh, can you explain what was those uh, red arrows in your previous slide? I didn't quite catch that. Sorry. Ah, the arrows. Oh, you. I. I don't. We don't need them. <laughs> I. I'm sorry. That. That was for. They were. Okay. Fine. That's this fine. is the way. Okay. That's a kind of a useful contour one can use, in order to numerically do this tuning of this of the field value. 
Um, and, so, uh, so the so two I, plots are. So, what are the two plots? So, the the the, the one two curves on these two. Comp is it the complex scale factor or something? Or what what is this? Uh, what okay, are the so, tools? Yeah. So so the what I'm showing is the complexified plane of time of the time. So the same as same as here. Oh, I see. And the uh, one of them time. is scalar, and one of them is scalar, or the scale. And factor. one is yeah. And then one plot is showing where the scale factor is becoming real. Here, the the black curve, and the right plot is showing where the scalar field is becoming real valued. And the the point that I'm making is that they don't become real at in the same places. Unless you tune the value of the scalar field, if you do that, they can become real on overlapping curves. I mean, overlapping if you were to put the two plots on top of each other. So, but if you set phi equal to zero, you should basically get the plot that you had in the previous slide where the, the Euclidean one was matched onto the Lorentzian one. Is that correct? If phi equal zero is also an extremum of the potential, yes. Then you oh, would I get yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. If it's not an extreme of the potential, it will yeah. start rolling yeah. and then you get more something like this. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And then you need to tune it. So as soon as the potential is uh, inclined, you need to tune the value of the scalar field. And the, the interesting thing is that this is actually possible, that you can find the value with such that at late times, A and phi become real. And this is in fact only possible because inflation is an attractor. So if you if you take something which is not an attractor, it doesn't work. Thanks. Um, and so this is, and it turns out that tuning this uh, that this attractor behavior is also, and this is related to this issue of of fields becoming real. This is also the condition for getting a a classical space time. Um, for for having the wave function b of wkb form so this this is all linked together Gilu, i wanted to ask in the, just one more thing in this regard uh, yes so uh, you are plotting a and phi at a one part for the saddle point or uh... yes this would be this would be a saddle point yes yeah so only one saddle point you are assuming that there is only one saddle point I so am. Suppose, uh, suppose yes. I mean, uh, like if there are multiple saddle points, like uh, they might, uh, yeah. I mean, as you know, like for each of them, one has to make sure that this condition is satisfied. If there are multi, yes, exactly. This is, and if there are multiple saddle points, um, it may occur that not that you cannot satisfy this in principle for all of them, but uh, one has to see. You see, if there are multiple saddle points typically one of them will dominate right right huh. and so that's the one that will, we will go and because it's, you know it's an exponential in the action if if one saddle point dominates it dominates completely hmm. it, uh, you, you can actually ignore the uh, the subdominant ones right so right. so in that sense then what i am talking about here would be the dominant saddle point okay i see i see that, that's what i'm saying I'm, I'm assuming that this exists that the integral exists and that an appropriate saddle point exists and in simple cases this is uh, has been shown to be the to be true but it's not known in under what general conditions this is this is uh, actually satisfied uh, what one does need for sure in order to get such saddle points is an attractor a dynamical attractor um and that's uh, that's already sort of an one way in which the no boundary proposal selects particular evolutions of the universe. So what I'm saying with this is that if you imagine a more complicated scalar potential where there are regions in which you could have inflation and other regions where you where, where the potential is too steep, then in those regions where the potential is too steep, there simply won't be uh, any prediction for a classical history of the universe. Yes, yes, right. So in that sense, the no boundary proposal already selects those regions where inflation occurs, or, or you know, you could have some other dynamical attractor. Um, oh. But uh, for if, you know, inflation is the obvious one. 
Ja, ja, ja. Now let me make one more um, comment about this, which is, so if you, again, if we look at the Friedman equation written out just for the scale factor A and the scalar field phi, now you see at the bottom of the geometry, we want this geometry to be compact. So we want A to go to zero, but we also, you see, this also means that but the geometry should also be regular, which means that when A goes to zero, this left-hand side should also should not diverge. Um, so A dot squared plus one should also go to zero. And this is again a way of showing, seeing that you need the Euclidean geometry. You see, A, the dots here is the physical time derivative. You cannot solve this in a, with a standard time. However, if you take a Vic rotated time tau, where tau is um, minus I T, or plus or minus it, I should say, then um, you see, then you, this can be satisfied. And this condition that a comma tau is equal to plus or minus one um, simply means that the geometry has to be Euclidean near, near the bottom. But this choice of sign is in fact um, very important. It looks like this is just a sort of an, an, a trivial thing but this choice of sign is the choice of Vic rotation. So one choice of sign, in fact, leads to perturbations that are obey a Gaussian distribution and um, that are suppressed. So where large perturbations are suppressed. Whereas if you take the opposite sign choice, um, the perturbations would obey an inverse Gaussian distribution, which would actually make the wave function non-normalizable you know, it would mean that larger and larger perturbations are more and more preferred. And that simply does not give you a large, smooth universe like the one we see. Or mathematically speaking, it gives you a wave function, which is not even normalizable. Uh, so we have to choose this stable sign. And um, that sign is, in fact, precisely that corresponds to the standard Vic rotation that is done in quantum field theory. What is important about this is that this choice of sign also determines the um, the weighting uh, of the background. So here, if there's a cosmological term lambda, you see this background goes as e to the plus one over lambda. Whereas if one had taken the other sign, it would have gone, gone like e to the minus one over lambda. And so it, it gives the opposite uh, predictions right you would in this case e to the plus one over lambda you would prefer small lambda um if so, so the here, other choice of it, sign it would be it would be the other way around so this h is the metric perturbation is that correct the h here is you can think of it as a as a gravitational wave perturbation yes a metric perturbation but in fact for scalar field perturbations one gets a completely analogous formula okay okay that's good. thank you but yes, in this case, the way I've written it, it would be gravitational wave perturbation. Also, the um, really the um, the dependence on the wave number k here would not be exactly k cubed, but the but the but it's something more like um, k times k minus one times k minus two, which the the expression you need on the, on the sphere, right? I mean, I've given just the approximation here for large k. I'm just what I'm trying to indicate here is that. In one case, you get the standard Gaussian perturbations that we see in the CMB. And in the other case, you get something which is completely differently behaved where large perturbations are preferred over small perturbations and, and where the, actually the model breaks down. So in, your, in, the, in the language that you're using before where there was a scalar field, this lambda would be the, the potential of the scalar field of the minimum or something like that? Is that, the, that the, the, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I've, I've written it out in that way here. If one, um, if one now takes the model with a scalar field, then what replaces the lambda would just be the value of the potential at the south pole, one, which is the bottom of the geometry. Um, sometimes one calls this south pole because it because it looks like the you know bottom half of the sphere, so it it uh, if one identifies this sphere with Earth, then this would that location would be the South Pole. Um, that's of course just jargon, um, but I'll sometimes use this expression. 
Okay, so that's that's what one would predict. And in fact, one would then predict the perturbations to be Gaussian and in, and more precisely in the bunch Davies state. So this, this sounds very good. However, there is something troubling about this e to the one over potential, which is that you can see from this formula, very you can see very clearly that you would prefer the potential to be small. So if you ask, you know, how long do you expect inflation to be, to last, you get something that, you know, that the highest probability would be for inflation to be as short as possible. Um, you need, as I said before, there needs to be some inflation, otherwise one does not get a classical universe at all. But it turns out that that's not very much that you need, just a few e-folds, say three or four or five e-folds. That's certainly enough to get an, a, a classical universe. However, that's too short to be in agreement with observations. In fact, it would not solve the flatness problem at all. Um, because here you see the, the spatial section is still a sphere, so that it would have a large curvature. Uh, also, you would not get CMB fluctuations on the right scales. And also the universe itself would be extremely small with such a small, with a, such a short inflationary phase. Uh, in any case, this is simply not in agreement with observations. So let me introduce one more recent idea, which might help in this regard. And this comes from, from the following question. We saw that no boundary solutions are typically complex solutions of the, of the field equations. But the question that one may ask is, what kind of complex solution should actually be allowed in quantum gravity? Can we, in fact, allow all possible complex solutions or, or maybe only some? Um, and I should say this is, again, a question which is not fully clarified, which is not fully, the answer to this question is not fully known, uh, but there has been some progress on this recently. So what is clear is that certain complex metrics are definitely useful. So for instance, if you take just the Schwarzschild black hole, and you make it, you, you, you transform it to a complex metric by doing a Vick rotation, then what you find is that um, it, this uh, black hole metric transforms into something which has this kind of cigar shape. So it turns out that the metric ends at the horizon and you have to make the Euclidean time coordinate periodic uh, in order for the, for the metric to be regular. So it turns out if you don't make it periodic, or if you choose the wrong period, then it has a, a deficit angle. It's it's um, it becomes singular. Uh, and but if you choose the correct uh, period, then this also automatically, by analogy with with quantum field theory, um, with thermal field theory, sorry, then by analogy with thermal field theory, you immediately get the correct temperature of the fluctuations. You get the Hawking temperature. And you can do the same thing with more complicated black hole metrics. For instance, if you take a rotating black hole, it has this dt d phi term, a term which in the which mixes time and an angular variable. If you uh, Vick rotate this, you get an explicitly uh, um, imaginary term in the metric. So the metric becomes complex. And these these metrics certainly seem to be physically sensible, and they in fact that's the quickest way of deriving the Hawking temperature. Uh, so these seem useful. There seems to be no reason to disregard them. But there are other um, metrics, complex metrics, which give much more nonsensical predictions. So here's a very simple example that was given by Witten in a paper um, last year or a couple of years ago. Um, you, you take ordinary flat space written in, in polar coordinates. But, and you see, if, you, if we take ordinary flat space here, this this coordinate r would be a radial coordinate. So it would take values going from zero to plus infinity, just real values from zero to plus infinity. But since this is gr, we can do a coordinate transformation. We can let r become a function of some new variable u. And this is simply a coordinate transformation. So it's still flat space, but now you see r can, as a function of u, could be a different kind of curve. For instance, it could be a curve which approaches the real axis at large negative and at large positive values of u, but in between it would go 
you know, around the origin. If you look at, then this becomes a complex metric. And in fact, it describes a kind of a wormhole because asymptotically, this is still flat space, but in between there's a complex wormhole. But you see, because this was flat space, uh, just written in strange coordinates, that means that this choice of coordinates will not change the value of the action and the action will still be zero. So now we have a zero action wormhole, but zero action means zero weighting also. It means that actually this is just as likely as a classical solution. It's not something like a tunneling solution, which is suppressed, but this would not be suppressed. The, these wormholes should exist everywhere if they were allowed. So just so clearly, so, yes. So in the in the lower plot, is it uh, is it U plane or R plane? Is it still R plane? It seems like this is it's the value. It's the R plane. It's the va sorry. It's it's the value of R of U. I see. So what I'm saying is R tends to positive, tends to real values at large. I see, I see. Uh, positive when it becomes large and positive. And sorry, I'm saying it differently. So you would have to let U be some real par parameter describing this curve. Now, along this curve, U could go, for instance, from minus infinity to plus infinity. In that case, but this is still the R plane where R takes values. Uh, when u goes to minus infinity, r would be approximately equal to, to u and at large positive values also. But for um, values of u near zero, say, r would be uh, complex and cross the imaginary axis here. Yeah, essentially it's a way of legitimizing extending r to minus infinity, right? Right, but you don't want to to go through zero yeah. because that would that would give you a singularity. Um, so it's it's uh, you know so you want it's just a it's sort of an an um, you can think of this as a complexified version of flat space, and then you take a very particular section through that complexified flat space. Right, and if uh, if R of U was uh, passing through the origin, then you would get, uh, instead of a complex wormhole, you would get two cones. Yeah, cones. yeah, and you just you just want to avoid having to deal with this co with the tip of the cone. Yes, thank you. Right, you, because this way it's cleaner, because everything is completely non-singular, right? So it's, you, there's no issue with, with so in, in in particular, this means you could make this this neck of the wormhole as big as you like, right? So there's no issue with saying, oh well, uh, but gravity should not apply anymore because you reach because of the the scales you reach are too large or something like this, right? So you can make this as smooth as you like. So it's clear from this argument that this kind of metric must be eliminated, right? It it simply it isn't it isn't uh, it doesn't make physical sense. Now, um, two mathematicians, Konsevich and Siegel, a um, couple of years ago, they presented a, a criterion for what kind of complex metric should be allowed. Now, I should say they were working in quantum field theory on complex backgrounds. So they tried to define quantum field theory on, on possibly complex background metrics. They were not considering gravity, but their criterion is the following. They said, we, if we want, we want a general quantum field theory to be well-defined on the particular space-time in question. So we want that the path integral for all possible P-form fields, um, we want th those path integrals to be convergent. Okay, and this gives you a condition on the kinetic terms for these these um, p-form fields. And uh, so f here is the field strength of a, of a p-form. So f is a p plus one form. And the reason for choosing p-forms is that these are known to be the only fields that have a spin of maximum one and that give a local covariant stress energy tensor. That's the Weinberg-Witten theorem. So the reasoning is to say, okay, if all of these fields are can be well defined, then that's 
then a general quantum field theory on that background should be fine. Okay, and then, so that's the criterion. The, if you write the metric in diagonal form, that's something you can always do at, a, at any point. You cannot typically do it globally, but point-wise you can do it. So you write g mu nu as some delta mu nu times lambda. So lambda would just be the, the diagonal elements in the metric. Then it turns out that this criterion that we just had, you can you find out that it translates into a condition on the arguments of these lambdas. In fact, the sum of arguments of these diagonal metric elements must be smaller than pi. One can show that if that's the case, then these um, actions for all p-form matter fields, they converge. Okay, so this... Um, I'm not going to go through the argument. It's easier if one does it, you know, it's easy to do and get it in two minutes. Uh, you just have to, but you have to just write it out on paper. Um, so there's a there's a simple criterion which they propose, which would tell you whether a given space-time metric or whether a given, yeah, a given metric is allowable or not. Now, um, one should, actually, I should point out that the idea they mean is that what they mean is that you you define your quantum field theory on such a complex space time, then you take the limit to go to Minkowski space time, which actually brings you to the boundary of this allowed domain. So it turns out that for Minkowski space time, where the first diagonal metric element is minus one, the argument is already pi. So you for Minkowski metric, you saturate this bound. So the idea of Kontsevich and Siegel is that we live on the boundary of this allowed domain. Uh, so mathematically speaking, you would do your calculations in sort of a deformation of Minkowski space-time, something like an I-epsilon I prescription. And then at the end of the calculation, you take your epsilon to zero and you get to a Lorentzian um, space-time. Uh, that's, that's their idea for, for quantum field theory. What's important there is that, you know, if you do something like this, you cannot let this epsilon change sign, right? This, so it's it's fine to go to the boundary of what's allowed, but you cannot cross that boundary. That's, that's what the, this bound would not allow it. And it turns out that uh, now if we go back to this pathological you know, metric. Uh, I have a question. Yes. So is it correct to say that this kind of a condition, uh, it is like a kind of a gauge fixing in a space of complex metrics? It's not really a gauge fixing. I mean, the idea is that the, 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 um, the metric is already given. Right. Um, See, uh, in the previous, it, like, if you have the freedom to, because all of these metrics, uh, uh, in the earlier slide when you said that the flat metric and is a relation by deforming with R. So those are like diffeomorphism really related and like basically the, in the path integral one can like if you impose the uh, gauge fixing then they won't be counted. So in that sense basically I was just wondering if like if we put these kind of additional conditions like whether maybe not sure but like maybe just um, yeah. Um. Yes, I see what you mean. It's it, it yeah in that example it is just an a coordinate transformation. Nevertheless, the what you end up with is really a different space time because it has different asymptotic structure and different so different um, boundary conditions also. Um, I, I so see. it's so it's not just I would say it's not just a, a gauge fixing, but a okay. part of it is yes. The trouble is that there is no complex generalization of the diffeomorphism group, so one cannot really talk about complex diffeomorphisms. I see. Um, uh, there, you have to. I would simply say it is a criterion for what kind of complex metrics you want to allow and what kind you don't. Uh, um, uh, but I agree that mathematically this should be made more precise. I, I see your point by saying this is very much like like simply a, a, a gauge fixing, but yeah, I think it's a bit more than that. But what I it is, what the precise mathematical description is, I think not really uh, clear. Okay. Okay. But uh, what I can show you here is you take this example again. And so now this is already in diagonal form, this metric. So we can just, when we just sum the arguments of these diagonal elements. Uh, so here, because we have three spatial dimensions, 
one would get a factor of three for the argument of R. But you see what happens is when you when R crosses the imaginary axis, then um, then its argument will be uh, pi by two, and the argument of R squared will be pi. So one gets a three pi contribution already, and this whole sum must be smaller than pi. So you can see that in, or in, if one does the same thing in D dimensions, one can immediately deduce that this sum over, over arguments would be bigger than D minus one times pi. And so this kind of metric is automatically ruled out. Uh, more on the other hand, one can do the same kind of analysis for these black hole metrics that I was showing. And there it turns out those are allowed. So this criterion seems to be reasonable. Um, it's not known whether this is a fundamental criterion or not. I would say it's it's something indicating what kind of criterion is needed. Um, for now, I will just take this criterion and see what consequences it has. Um, but one should keep in mind that understanding this criterion better, especially when gravity is, in, is, is present, uh, is, is an open question. Now, if we go back to these no boundary solutions with a scalar field. One can approximate the value of the imaginary part of phi at the south pole, and it's given by essentially um, v comma phi over v. So it's given by the steepness of the potential, by the square root of the first slow row parameter. So um, this indicates already that you know if the potential is flatter, the solutions should be more real. If it's steeper, the solutions will be more complex. Now, what we what we can do is go back to these kind of plots I had before showing where, you know, where you move in the complex time plane. And a particular no boundary solution ends at a certain point in this complex time plane. This, that's this point tau f here. Now, we can plot a curve, that's the red curve here, which shows where the sum of arguments takes the maximum value pi. And we know that for a metric to be allowed, one has to stay below pi. It turns out that translates into having to stay below that maximal curve. So if starting from zero, we plot this maximal curve in red, if we can stay below the curve, which here on the left plot is just possible, then the metric will be allowed. If, if, if it's like the right plot where you have to cross and go above this red line, then it's not allowed. So that's a numerical way of just seeing whether the the, the metric you have sh should uh, satisfy this Konsevich Siegel criterion or not. And this curve, one has to just calculate it numerically. There is no way of of solving it analytically. So one just has to numerically calculate the sum of arguments and then and always plot the particular direction in which the sum of arguments remains equal to pi. Um, and then something interesting happens. So yeah, I'm showing now the results for uh, a simple potential of natural inflation form. So a potential which goes like one plus cosine of phi over f. f is some constant, uh, which if this model comes from axions, this would be the axion decay constant. Uh, you can think simply think of it as a constant that determines how wide um, this, this potential is. Now there's something interesting that happens, which was first noticed by Hertog, Janssen, and, and Carlson which is that there is a there is a, a chain there is a there can be situations where you need a certain minimum number of e folds in order for such solutions to be allowable so basically if you are too low on the potential uh, it turns out the metrics are not allowable and that's because they are more complex if you go further up on the potential you see the potential becomes flatter. And when the potential becomes flatter, the field values become more real. And then uh, these arguments of metric elements become smaller. And then at some point, the geometry is allowed. Now, what's interesting is that the minimum number of e-folds that are required depends on this, this constant f. But you see here for f equals 4, it's a bit over 20. For f equals 5, it's around 40. For f equals 6, it's around 60. You get values which are sort of order of order 10, say, or, or 10 to 100 or so. 
Um, now, one should um, compare this with what... Okay, so what's the consequence of this? Now, you see, we said earlier the no-boundary proposal prefers being low on the potential. So you have a higher probabil probability the lower you go on the potential. However, if you are too low, the solution is simply not allowable. That's this red region here. And in blue would be the region which is allowable. But if you combine the two effects, you see you would be most likely to be allowable, but as low as possible. So to be sort of just at the edge of where it is allowable. And so, in fact, you would, you would, uh, what this means is that if you combine this no boundary weighting with this complex metric criterion, you, you predict that inflation should last sort of a certain um, minimal amount of efaults. Minimal, but such that the metric is still allowed. Now, if you look at what these models that I just showed predict, then the minimal values are always these big dots at the end of the lines. You see, when f is small, we are uh, outside of what is compatible with observations here in terms of spectral index ns and uh, scalar, uh, tensor to scalar ratio r. Uh, but if f gets around to about 6 or 6.5, you see we start being in, um, in sort of the um, inside of the regions that are allowed. I should also say that the Planck results are shown with the assumption that the universe is spatially flat. If you relax that assumption, like here, and assume the universe is spatially curved, these error bars would be a bit bigger. So we would be more inside the, the error bars. Um, and then also the running of the spectral index becomes very small in, in agreement with observations when f gets to about six. So the interesting thing is that now one gets an, a connection between observations and the number of e-folds. And you see that we find we do not, in a sense, we do not predict 60 e-folds with these models. However, you can say that the models which are in agreement with observations also have at least 60 e-folds of inflation. So there is a, a correlation between these two things where before there wasn't one. Before these were independent. The fact, you know, the the, the spe prediction for spectral index and number of e-folds were completely independent. In this framework, these two things become linked. And what's interesting is that it seems to fit, right? So if, if the number of e-folds is large enough, it also gives a model which is in agreement with observations. Of course, this depends on what kind of potential you assume, but we find very similar results for other plateau potentials. And interestingly, if you take something like chaotic inflation, m squared, phi squared, you find that you do not get any allowable solutions at all. The potential is always too steep. So this clearly prefers these plateau type potentials. And moreover, it gives something which is in, in, uh, in good agreement with observations. Now, we can go further now because now we have this complete um, model. One can see, say, you know, how big is the universe? How, how big do we expect the universe to be? So we go back to this formula, which I had at the beginning. The current size is given by the nucleation size, then the amount of inflationary expansion, then and then the expansion during radiation and matter phases. Now, it turns out that the, nu so the nucleation size for the no-boundary proposal is simply the Hubble scale. That is the scale at which the universe starts becoming classical. And this goes as 1 over the reheating temperature squared. Moreover, this requirement that we have minimal inflation, um, which comes from this allowability criterion, um, one can also show I'm not showing it here, but I, it's in the paper if you're interested in, in this. One can show that this is proportional also to the reheating temperature. If you put these, these things together, these relations, you see we get an 1 over t squared from the nucleation size. We get another factor of t from this factor and another factor of t from the radiation phase. It turns out that 
the size of the universe becomes independent of the inflationary scale. So you could have a no boundary instanton in which you nucleate at a larger size, but then you will automatically expand a bit less, or you could nucleate at a smaller size and expand a bit more. You always end up with the same current size of the universe. This is an, an, a sort of a funny feature of the no boundary proposal. And if one has this minimal amount of inflation, that means that in fact, one would expect the universe to be not much larger than the part which we currently observe. Um, and perhaps this is even obser observable in the future in the sense that if the universe is really just a little bit bigger than it had to be, um, then omega k might be measurable in the future. The trouble is that oh, the current bounds on the omega k, so on the curvature parameter, are at about 1%, and they are observable certainly to about 10 to the minus 4, but at about 10 to the minus 5, it gets difficult because one has the CMB fluctuations at that level, and they, it becomes difficult to disentangle what's now, you know, due to CMB fluctuations and what was what is just the, you know, it becomes more or less impossible to disentangle the low L modes in the CMB with just the average curvature. So, so there is sort of a small window of opportunity where omega k could still be measured and where one could show that the universe indeed is positively curved spatially. But if it lasts, if inflation lasts a bit more than that, it won't, won't be possible to, to see it from in this way. Maybe there are other ways, but in this way, it, it will not be possible. So, so the minimal inflation assumption that you had was uh, was it put by hand or was there a reason other than? Uh, well, so it 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 kind of comes out because of this. So it it comes out here because it turns out that the point at which the un the the metrics become allowable, this and this turns out to be pretty much exactly the the sixty e folds. Right, Which so that's basically but the boundary of allowability, right? That's the boundary of allowability. Yes, between, but it, it is. Yeah. Yes, and it happens to be. That's what I'm saying. It it happens to be, and this is a nice or interesting coincidence. It happens to be at the same level, where we also know you need that. That's the minimum number of e-folds of inflation that you need to solve the flatness problem. And here you can calculate that number exactly because, what you need to do is you need to dilute. The curvature of this sphere so the universe has a is is spatially a sphere which has a, a given curvature and you need to dilute that so it's not like in in you know normally when people talk about the flatness problem they say well if the universe had an omega k of order one initially then you need so and so many e-folds of inflation here we, we don't need to say something like order one we have the exact relation the exact number for omega k. So what I'm saying is you can calculate omega k as a function of the scale factor a, and then you see that you need a certain minimal number of e-folds, which is about 60 for these models here, um, in order to solve the flatness problem. And that also happens to be precisely the minimum number in order to have an allowable metric. So it's this is, a, in my view, a complete coincidence. Uh, and we don't actually have an explanation for why these two things happen to occur at the same time. But given that they do, one would predict that the universe is just a little bit bigger um, than than the region that we currently see. And is, is, that's it, is, it, is it correct to say that so the the boundary between uh, you know the trade-off between this exponential coming from the you know the one by v phi and uh, this allowability of metric you know, so you get some value for the scale factor and that happens to be precisely the one that uh, just about enough to solve the flatness problem is that your statement? yes exactly it it okay. all fits together it's it's quite uh, quite remarkable and i don't know if it's just a huge coincidence or if there is more to it right i mean this is this is what comes out it's definitely something I would like to understand better. A priori, these two things are unrelated. But here we see that they just it just so happens that for models which are also in agreement with observations, this minimal amount that you need to get an allowable metric is also the minimum 
you need in order to solve the flatness problem. Is that statement independent of the the potential that you had this uh, axion potential? No, that... no, it is. It is not not in the, it. So it turns out that for um, we find a very similar results for all kinds of plateau potential. So if you take something like the Starobinsky potential, you get basically the same. Um, however, if you take like, as I said, if you take something like m squared phi squared, you, you find that this is not allowable at all. Right. So in that sense, but the allowability really... criterion is in, in is in tension with, uh, let's say, m squared phi squared or some of those. Yes. Potential. Yes. Strongly in tension. Um, so. Okay. One should also say m squared phi squared is not really that in that good agreement with observations anyway. So if I if I include this criterion of saying it also has to be in agreement with observations, then it there seems to be a link. Um, but it's well, something that you. needs to be, to be understood better. Now, let me just make a quick comment about about string theory, which is that, you know, with the the swampland conjectures imply that, you know, at least. Um, one of the two uh, slow roll parameters epsilon or eta um, must be must be large so either the first derivative or second derivative of the potential must be large so this this is sort of this works pretty much okay with these plateau potentials and it would not have worked for chaotic inflation so there's another link here that these plateau potentials seem to work quite well together with the um with this allowability criterion but again i don't know I don't think there is, well, at least currently, no deeper link is known. Another thing is that if dark energy, current dark energy, also satisfies these um, uh, swampland conditions, then you see that means that the current potential for dark energy also cannot can you know must must have some slope, and that dark energy presumably will will decay in the future. And if Dark, the dark energy goes to negative values, which seems possible, then the universe will recollapse. And then, in fact, um, the universe would not just be small in terms of spatial size, but then it would also, you know, crunch within a an, an reasonably short time. So it would also be small in terms of time uh, duration. But that's, again, that's something that it would be interesting to explore in a bit more detail. So um, that brings me to the end of the talk. Let me briefly summarize. I've presented a model that I would say is potentially complete as a cosmological model. Um, of course, modulo all the open questions that I mentioned. And this is inflation, but with no boundary initial conditions. And there's an interesting competition that occurs in these models between having a higher weighting for short inflationary phases but requiring a long enough inflationary phase in order for the, the, the metrics to be allowable. So these two criteria work against each other and they seem to prefer um, a phases of inflation that are short, but long enough to be in agreement with observations, but short enough that the consequence would be that the universe is actually not much bigger than the part that we've already seen. Thank you for your attention. So thanks, uh, Jinlu, for the wonderful talk. So uh, are there any questions? Uh, there is one question uh, in the chat box. And one more question in the chat box. So the first question is, uh, Jinlu, can you see the chat box? Um, I, I have, uh, yes, now I can see it, yes. Uh, the first question is that I take k equals one. Um, ah, yes. Well, this is this is an, an, an a choice of units. So, so I'm choosing. Uh, so I can set k equals one simply by cho choosing the appropriate units for the scale factor a. And so the fact that that the, currently the curvature is is small, you see, k can be one, but the omega will go like you know one over a squared. And so when A is, it just means that A has to be sufficiently large. Um, so, so this is just a choice of units.
Now, the second question was, uh, to my understanding, employing the boundary proposal with allowability criterion gives a theoretical prediction of the size of the universe without compromising on the flatness problem. What are the consequences if one tries to employ the tunneling proposal? Ah, well, the, the trouble with the tunneling proposal is that this is precisely the case where you choose this other sign for, for the Vic rotation. So in that case, you get perturbations which are out of control. And um, so in fact, if you look at the, the background geometries are would be complex conjugates of each other. So they would uh, satisfy the same condition for the allowability criterion. Right? It would, would actually be the exact same criterion, but if you now put perturbations on this geometry, they will blow up. So one would one would get the same um, because the because this allowability criterion is a sum of absolute values of arguments. If you change a geometry to its complex conjugate, you get the same value. But um, it's not. But but there the the real problem with the tunneling proposal is this this issue that the perturbations are blowing up, and in particular, gravitational wave perturbations, which you cannot change because they are already you know their action is given is already part of the of the Einstein Hilbert action, so it's automatic. These are automatically there, and there's nothing you can do about the fact that they blow up. Uh, Jin Luke, I wanted to ask regarding something about perturbations. So, uh, yes. can we expand? Uh, so, like, uh, we have just considered up to like second order in the perturbation h square. And uh, suppose we like uh, somehow, depending on how flexible we are with the computation, like uh, we can pro probably let's assume that maybe we can go a little bit higher h cube, h4, some such thing like that. So, yes. like, is it uh, possible to like? Uh, mm, uh, I mean, uh, the boundary will be still be fair. Like, uh, still, uh, I mean, uh, the perturbations will be still favoring the no boundary. Like, even if you go to H cube or H four or some such thing like that. Yes, I mean there. So I think the easiest way to see that is that you can formulate, you can find no boundary instantons also for something like the um, the biaxial Bianchi nine metric. So this is a metric which. Which uh, it's like Bianchi nine, but you set the two possible anisotropy perturbations equal to each other, and but you see if if um, in that case this can be seen as like a nonlinear version of of a gravitational wave perturbation, right? Because the, the, the you know this is an exact metric. This this biaxial Bianchi nine is an is an exact can be an exact solution of the equations of motion. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you you get the exact same thing. So you could, that in principle, you can take one of those. This would just be one fluctuation, right? It would just be one gravitational wave fluctuation, yes. but non-linearly. So you, in fact, this is this is the result for one perturbation up to any order you like. I see, I see. Huh. And that that works, and that gives the same. You know, it it shows that in principle these this is possible, but huh. I don't think anybody has done it sort of in general, say for non-Gaussianities or so, I don't think it has been done. Okay, okay. But I think this argument that I just I've just given would or shows you that there should be no obstacle in principle. Right, right. I see, I see. And, and yes. one more thing I wanted to ask. Uh, so uh, like uh, in, a, in the Neumann boundary condition, I mean, uh, it is known, well, it has been seen that basically there's a transition uh, of some kind of a, like a shift that happens from the Euclidean to Lorentzian signature. Now, in the Euclidean path integral, we know that there is an issue of the divergence and conformal factor problem. So like when we go back in the early times, like the, the, so the universe basically go from Lorentzian to Euclidean, basically in, the, in that particular uh, part of the universe, I mean, I mean, like when the universe is again Euclidean at that time, like there would be still be issue of uh, this uh, uh, conformal factor problem. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, do you have some uh, like something on this? Um, so I, okay, well, with the Neumann boundary conditions there, you still need to, you need to sum over certain complex classes of metrics to get a, a, a convergent path integral. Right. 
And and so, but then once you have that definition, you can go to small sizes also, and it's still the definition still still holds. But the path, the integrate, you it yes, it can happen that when you go to a final size that's smaller than the 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 radius, the, the Hubble radius. Yes, where, where actually you expect the geometry to be purely Euclidean. Yes, uh, you can. It yeah. Then typically you need to change the contour of integration. Right. Yes. So it's so you can do it, but you do you do need to change the the integral yeah. Is, yeah. is defined a bit differently. Right, right. That that's again one of the things that you know there should be a general prescription ideally, which under all conditions always tells you what the integration contour should be. Huh. But I think that's not known at the moment. But in in examples, you can see what the contour should be. Right. You right. can you can find one that works. I see, I see, I see. But it, uh, I would say, what's not really solved yet is what is the physical. You know, what's the physical ah. meaning of that contour? That's ah. not known. Ah. See, like if you yeah. just uh, work out the Neumann path integral and like uh, it gives you some basically some uh, uh, like uh, exact result in terms of any function you will get. Now, what uh, it's seen that if you reduce the size of the universe, then basically you will see that uh, it's behaving like a Euclidean universe. Now, the question that occurs in our mind, like when the universe is behaving like a Euclidean thing, do I again witness uh, the this uh, conformal factor issues or not? But yeah, as you rightly said that uh, even if you do the mathematics, I mean you can you can clearly see that okay, there is this uh, Euclidean saddle that is uh, there, which is becoming relevant, and the contour gets appropriately chosen at that time. Yes, I should add that, you know, when the wave function is not a WKB form when you go to such small sizes, so you right. don't you don't really have a classical. So saying the universe is Euclidean is not really true. It's not mm -hmm. really, it's not really a classical universe at all. I see. There is no right. classical right. geometry at all. You should think it's more like it's like, it's a bit like asking what happens to a particle that's tunneling while it is tunneling. Yeah. You know, we 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 sort of while it is under the barrier, we we see it when it comes out of the barrier and it it behaves classically again. Yeah, but we don't really know. We cannot really say, at least right now, I think one cannot ah. really say what's happening to the particle when while it is under the barrier. And yeah. when the universe is this small, this is the, the the analogous situation to when the particle is still under the barrier. Okay. So yeah. mathematically, one can one can describe it, but I would say physically, it's not really a classical universe. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Uh, I think there was another question. Yeah, there the are a couple of questions in the chat box. Yes. So uh, let me see. Chathan has another question. So there's also. A well, okay. If they were, uh, so he's asking if one can um, reformulate this um, condition on on the metric, the allowability condition by a combined condition on metric and scalar field, and that's actually something that I have um, I did look into a little bit. Um, so yes, it turns out there are situations in which the scalar field arises from dimensional reduction and in the higher dimensional theory is actually part of the metric. In that case, one would then impose the, the allowability criterion directly on the higher dimensional metric, which would imply a condition on the scalar field also. And one finds in these cases a similar kind of condition that the again, the scalar field cannot be too complex. So it's it's a it's a very similar kind of condition that one finds. Still, it's not it doesn't seem to be the exact same condition than if you just work in the lower dimensional theory. So there is something to be understood about this because, of course, the criterion should be there should be you know an, a criterion which where it doesn't which doesn't depend on on whether you work with the dimensionally reduced theory or in the um, uh, full in, in the theory with all spatial dimensions so i i think that's that's one of the yeah that's that's showing that when gravity is included this criterion is not fully worked out yet um but something like this criterion appears to be correct because it it, it simply from the fact that it does eliminate metrics that are clearly pathological and it allows metrics that are clearly useful so it has to be something along those lines. 
but again this this is this is uh, you know an area where one can do more work and i'm sure there's there's more things to be figured out there there is a question by vikram uh, so it's before chetan's question ah sorry i missed it let me let me take a look yes yeah, so so um restricting to restricting to allowable metrics can mean that can be in tension with the picard lefschetz approach with the integration contour because it can be that that the integration contour that you would like to use runs into a region of field space where where the metrics are not allowable and uh, it, when we looked at this for specific examples this indeed did happen so that means that in that case, one has to somehow change the the integration contour. Uh, I I think that this could be could have something to do with the fact that that you know this is a limitation of mini superspace. All the examples that we've looked at so far are in mini superspace, where only particular kinds of complexifications of the metric are possible. But you see, normally, if you take a metric, you have many different ways of of making it complex. It depends on how you write the metric. This is again comes back to uh, to Gaurav's question about you know is this just a gauge fixing, but there there's many if you take a certain metric depending on how you write it and and depending on how you let it be complex, you know certain complex extensions are possible are allowed and some are just not possible, and so I think the trouble is that we don't know what should be the correct way of of extending a given real metric. Um, to the complex domain and i think when this happens when when the complex metrics start running into the when when the allowability criterion starts running into the integration contour that perhaps one has just written the metric in the wrong way there what what is important at, you know what is certainly important and that's what i focused on here in this talk is that the saddle point itself is allowable one can always find another way of writing the metric and then you know changing the integration contour to go along that particular way um but but what you certainly need is that the saddle point itself is allowable and so that that's the criterion which i was using here but i think this this question of what happens off shell is is very interesting and and again it's something one can explore more So any more questions? Yeah, there's one more question. No, thanks. Okay. Uh, so, okay. Any more questions? Uh, anybody wants to ask something more? Okay. Seems like uh, people are going back uh, home. It's a little late, uh, 530 over here. But uh, right. it's a very good talk. And since there are no more questions, so let's thank the speaker again. And uh, Thank you very much. Uh, it was really a pleasure to hear your wonderful talk. And uh, I learned quite a bit, a lot of things that were missing in my understanding of this. And thanks to Jin Luke for uh, giving us a wonderful presentation and the nice talk. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks for, the, for all the questions and all the attention. That's, uh, uh, it was a pleasure. Yeah. So I will just now switch it off and once again, thanks. And we will meet again probably in a couple of weeks. All right, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah.